Fantastic. So thank you so much, uh, Professor. Uh, you, I think you made my talk very easy already. Uh, a lot of things you said, so you know that makes me uh, a lot, my life easier to talk about strategies to manage the mycotoxin risk uh, in dairy cows. It is a very complicated subject, uh, of course, as compared to the monogastric animals, as Professor already mentioned. Uh, I'll try to see my be you know, the best of uh, integrating different approaches to uh, manage these risks so that you know we can uh, protect the uh, economic uh, uh, losses uh, from the, to the farmers. So already Moss introduced me you know, very well. Uh, as a company, you know, uh, in Trau or Nutreco, we are looking at feeding the future. And uh, of course, uh, uh, doing this sustainably is, is very important. And that's why, you know, supporting the global feed industry in producing the safe feed, uh, what Professor mentioned already, safe feed is a prerequisite for a safe food. And uh, mycotoxins play a very important role in making sure that the food uh, we produce for the human consumption uh, is safe. And of course, with operational excellence uh, being present in different parts of the world uh, so that we can serve the customers, uh, dairy customers across the world. So in terms of the feed safety, uh, various programs we have uh, in our organization is uh, actually covers the entire value chain, right from the sourcing of the raw materials from different parts of the world, or maybe within a country, a big country, even moving from one state to another state, uh, it can, can cause a lot of challenges during the transportation. So, we do have that uh, treatment of raw materials uh, to reduce the impact, negative impact of feed safety. Uh, and then at the feed mill level, where for dairy, you produce your concentrate, uh, you know, protein meals being added there, premixes being added there, you know, how to protect the value of those uh, at the feed mill uh, through your feed mill hygiene, mycotoxin risk management become an important there. And of course, uh, you know, maybe home mixers, uh, uh, which are most of them are farms, farmers try to produce their own uh, feed as well. Uh, you know, they also play an important role. And uh, finally, the food production is, uh, is that's where I think mycotoxins play a much more significant role as compared to the monogastrics. Uh, because the residues of mycotoxins, as Professor mentioned already, have a bigger impact in milk, uh, especially with aflatoxin uh, M1 coming in there. Uh, so since aflatoxin M1 has a human health implications, causing potentially cancer in children and, and uh, adults as well, uh, we need to have a, a you know HACCP approach, as you know, hazard analysis, critical control point approach to manage that, uh, so that you know all the gaps in our production system are, are considered and we pro uh, provide uh, right answers for uh, for those gaps through various analysis through various techniques uh, becomes uh, very important so not to dwell too much but just to give an idea what professor already mentioned there is so much of complexity around the mycotoxins in dairy cows if you go back to the history history a lot of people have said that you know the dairy cows or ruminants in general can manage uh, mycotoxins quite well because of the rumen microflora. But uh, what we need to consider is that unlike monogastric animals, there is a, a role of silages, hay, haylage, and you know green grasses all coming in, and more byproducts being used in dairy cows. Uh, so it becomes much more complexity in terms of the mycotoxin sourcing. Uh, uh, in case of ruminants as compared to the monogastric animals. So, of course, the major part of the, uh, the dairy feed is uh, TMR is also silages and uh, managing silage become very critical. Like you see in the pictures, uh, you know, physarium can grow. Uh, you can have a phenicillium growing in there. The mucar mold can grow. Mucar, which is, of course, not a, a major toxin producing. And but various uh, fungus can grow, what the professor has mentioned already, uh, are causing significant uh, challenges. So the silage management becomes very critical uh, to manage the mycotoxins uh, uh, in general. So why is mycotoxin production, uh, why does the mycotoxin production happen in silages? There are a number of reasons. Of course, you know, all of you are in dairy, 
you understand that if there is a, a dry silage, if the covering of the silage is very poor, if the packing density or the packing is not good, if, if the face management is not good, that means you take away too much of uh, a silage uh, from the face uh, than what is required for feeding that day. Uh, or uh, maybe not using the right instruments to cut the silage. So these can cause uh, movement of air into the silage. As the movement of air go and increases, the, the growth of yeast increases to start with. And we know the yeast consumes lactic acid and then it increases the pH of the silage. So the, the, for preservation of silage, low pH is important. When the pH goes up, the other aerobic microorganisms. Of course, the more air going in, the other uh, aerobic microorganisms like fusarium and you know, listeria, clostridia, other bacteria as well start growing. Uh, and uh, causing the mycotoxin formation, even leading to the deterioration of, uh, of silages. And I'm sure you know, sometimes the silage quality is not good, uh, especially I've seen in alpha-alpha uh, silage, you can smell that from you know, kilometers uh, together. Uh, so due to the production of some uh, unwanted acids uh, within these uh, silages. So certainly in a suboptimal silage uh, manufacturing, uh, will lead to the mycotoxin formation. So another area where you know we are looking at strongly, and uh, Professor, I think, uh, slightly mentioned about this, is an area called emerging mycotoxins. Uh, these are the mycotoxins that are not routinely analyzed anywhere in the world, nor re legislatively regulated. Professor also mentioned these mycotoxins don't show up in the EU regulation or FDA regulation. However, the evidence of their incidence is rapidly increasing. That means when a commercial laboratory or the university to start doing the analysis, these will start coming up and we coin them as emerging mycotoxins. And these are some of the names in Fusaria mycotoxins. We have Fusaric acid, Eniatins, uh, Bevorosine, and, and quite a few of them. In Aspergillus, we have steric matter cysteine, emodine, alternaria toxins and penicillium mycotoxins, uh, especially mycophenolic acid, you know, which can be produced by various penicillium fungus within the silage. And of course, as Professor Mon mentioned, RACO14C uh, is also a, a good marker for the uh, presence of uh, penicillium toxins within the silage. So these are the emerging toxins. We, uh, the Europe is already giving a lot of attention to that. And uh, we also started looking at how to manage these mycotoxins in addition to what we have already know the big six uh, toxins. The next one is a masked mycotoxins, uh, which are actually uh, present uh, within these raw materials or the silages or the feeds, uh, but they are conjugated to the glucose molecule. And this is something we have been hearing for quite some time now. And uh, you know, in some of the raw materials like corn and wheat, this can be present up to the 88 percent of the total concentration as you can see on the left side dawn and the right side dawn 3 glucose the structure is different that's why when you're doing a regular hplc lcms ms or uh, to some extent even elisa uh, you only measuring the free dawn not the conjugated form of dawn and that's what professor was mentioning rumen rumen and animals can take more dawn but the question is are we measuring the entire amount of dawn and i think the answer is no because dawn 3 glucose uh, is not measured in most part of the world i think in europe they start uh, analyzing this as a routine uh, but i think in most other regions uh, this is not being analyzed again these are adding to the the complexity of the mycotoxins which is already big in ruminant ruminant diets uh, and exposure in the ruminant animals these are just some names it is not just dawn in the masked form, we have nivalenol, we have T2 toxin, HT2 toxin, zerelanon, all these are present. I think many of you as a dairy farmer, sometimes you do the analysis of zerelanon, you see a very low level of zerelanon, but actually the, the cows are showing the symptoms, reproductive issues, uh, maybe not coming into, you know, coming into the heat uh, when uh, unexpectedly are uh, taking more inseminations uh, per, pregnancy. Uh, so all these are an indication that maybe some forms of the toxins uh, we are not unable to measure today uh, using the conventional methods of uh, analysis. 
And then uh, I just had one slide about uh, the impact of Dawn. Uh, this is a study from US, North Carolina State University. Yes, the cows can take a little bit more Dawn than pigs, uh, but already, you know, uh, we, they have observed a decrease in the crude, pro uh, you know, the microbial protein produced uh, within the rumen of the cow as compared to control at 3.1 ppm dawn you saw only 680 grams so significant reduction uh, of course there and metabolizable protein uh, gram per day was also significantly reduced at the p value of 0.05 so again showing that ruminant animals can be susceptible to dawn also depending upon the level depending upon what form are present and depending on what other mycotoxins like silage mycotoxin causing damage to the rumen uh, microflora. So that is the challenge we have in hand. Then how are we going to diagnose? So I think professor already mentioned about the feces. Uh, you know, I didn't add it here, but that's a great way to look at it. Uh, but uh, you know, when you go to your farm, you might be observing undigested feed in the feces or uh, you might be absorbing poor repro, uh, you know, health is not good, more somatic cell counts, the incidences of mastitis, laminitis is increasing, the poor milk production, all these are some of the indicators of a potential mycotoxin a problem uh, in cows. Uh, but again, this can be caused by pathogens also, so a differential diagnosis becomes uh, very important. So that's why we, uh, as Professor mentioned, you know, yeah, some people take the feed uh, or raw materials for mycotoxin analysis uh, for Afla, Okra, T2, uh, Fimonosins, those six uh, common mycotoxins, what we analyze, they can be done for raw materials and in the feed. Also, another way of particularly uh, to maintain the public health uh, important, uh, public health of humans is uh, measuring aflatoxin M1 in milk. Uh, that is a very good indicator of a potential aflatoxin challenge uh, in the cows. Silage quality uh, is a good indicator, definitely. The mold and yeast counts within those silages also a good idea, it gives you a good idea. And uh, HPLC or LCM SMS analysis for forages and TMR, because we don't recommend uh, ELISA based methods for forages and TMR. So if there is a facility uh, which uh, you know you can use that. To be more assertive. But I think what I really liked is also an approach of looking at feces for microbial population, which we will definitely look at uh, going forward. Can it be a commercialized uh, option? A little bit on MycoMaster Plus. Uh, some of you might have heard already. Uh, we have MycoMaster and we have MycoMaster Plus. Uh, MycoMaster Plus uh, is a, what we do is uh, uh, we can analyze aflatoxin M1 in addition only to the feed and raw materials. So aflatoxin, Dawn, Fimonosin, Zia, T2HT2, OTA, plus the M1 in milk can be analyzed using the same equipment, what we call is the MicroMaster Plus. This is good as at a feed mill level, rapid tool to test the uh, potential challenge. And of course, we have two types of MicroMaster Plus. One is for, uh, we call it as MRL, and another we call it as FL. And the MRL is for uh, 0.05 ppb or 50 ppt. And uh, in case of SL is for, you know, looking at United States of America level of 0.5 ppb or 500 uh, ppt. So there are two types. So depending upon which one you, you want to regulate in your country uh, is important to use that. Otherwise you may get a wrong uh, information. So then what we do with MicroMaster Plus, uh, fortunately, uh, you know, the, the customers or our laboratories using these MicroMaster Plus, uh, uh, some of them, uh, most of them are connected to our database so that we get the data. And if any customer that is connected uh, their MicroMaster to our system, they get a customized advice, what we call as the mycotoxin advisor, you know, which helps in monitoring the raw materials and feeds, you know, adapt formulation. Uh, for example, if uh, one of the raw material like corn has got too much of toxins, maybe they use lower the amount of uh, that raw material going into their TMR. And of course, how much toxo as a toxin binder to use also, it uh, gives an idea. 
So this is just an example, mycotoxin advisor, you know, you can, this is a sample just from uh, South Africa. Uh, you know, it was a maize sample, uh, you know, it tells you how much is there. And it also tells you based on the practical guidance values, whether it is toxic or not. You know, you can choose a species, you can choose dairy or, or, or poultry or pigs, uh, provide you the information. So moving on to the management, which is of course is, is very important uh, for all of us. There is a problem in front of us, we know that. And someone already asked the question uh, about, uh, uh, you know, how do we treat, how do we manage the mycotoxin uh, production at the field level before being harvested? So this is why I consider, my, you know, the 10 point system for our mycotoxin risk management, starting from what are the good agricultural practices? As Professor mentioned already, do, doing the good flowering or tilling uh, definitely helps to uh, put all these the molds from the previous crop get into the bottom of the soil so that you know they are not present to contaminate the next year crop uh, easily. But of course, there are reasons why people don't want to do the tilling. No till is a common practice in many parts of the world. Then the rotation of crops is also important. Uh, if you rotate the crops one year with protein source, another with energy source, there is a chance uh, that you can reduce the amount of the un unwanted molds growing. But how many are doing is a big question. Uh, because in US, uh, as I know that people are growing more corn after corn because of economic value. And this may be happening in other parts of the world as well. Crop management, use of fungicides, it works sometimes. Resistance development is also there. Harvest management, grain treatment is, is critical because if you more control the molds, you can control mycotoxins. So certainly we have a you know, tool in our uh, toolbox, Phylax, to help in that. The silage management is also critical. Uh, you know, when you are having a good uh, silage practices, as I mentioned to you, which I have one slide, which I'll explain to you in that. The feed mill hygiene, because we have seen, uh, you know, depending on different parts of the world, the hygiene in the feed mill uh, varies. And if you have a molds running around in the feed mill, of course, you have a more chances of contamination and uh, producing mycotoxins. Mycotoxin mitigation uh, aspect, uh, because today we cannot call them as a mycotoxin uh, binder, uh, if you ask me, because more and more mycotoxins, uh, what we are discovering may not be bound so we need to have a different strategy. So I would call more as a mycotoxin mitigation product. And then the, the transportation of feed, uh, we know very well, probably if it is within a small distance is not an issue, but if you are traveling far away, far off places, it can be a, a big issue. We need to take care of how you do the feed uh, during the transportation. And finally, the TMR management uh, is also very critical because heating of TMR can be an issue. Uh, so that's where you know, our product Selco TMR has been used quite successfully to reduce uh, the heating of silages. As you can see in this slide, uh, you know, compared to the, the control, whenever you use a Selco TMR, uh, the temperature within that uh, you know, silage has come down, indicating uh, that less mold growth, less yeast production within that uh, silage so as Professor mentioned already, the cows will be happy uh, consuming those TMR uh, more readily than the one that may have heating and have more molds and, and bacteria being present in there. So I will spend a little bit more time uh, into the mycotoxin mitigation product. Uh, of course, we have done a lot of research in this area and the research is ongoing as well. And we believe that uh, a mycotoxin mitigation product uh, should have multiple features. And I think that's uh, uh, self-explanatory because when the challenge itself is, uh, has got multiple factors, then the solution has to fit that. Otherwise, you will be addressing only part of the problem. So why understanding uh, mycotoxin binding limitation is important because we know already, you know, fortunately, the aflatoxin challenges, if you use a very good quality bentonite or an asmectite clays, you can manage that. And uh, I think that is a good, uh, good tool we have to protect the human health. 
and uh, ergot toxins to some extent can also be bound very well by the bentonites toxins and endotoxins what professor was mentioning lps coming out of their faulty silages yes i think to some extent we can manage that using a good quality uh, a bentonite then they have only a moderate binding to the t2 toxin zia and ota you know a lot of research we have done uh, we don't see more than 50 percent it's always less than 50 percent binding to these these toxins now very little binding to dawn i think everybody knows that and what was interesting uh, with our experience is unlike what's there in the in the literature or some other organizations we see that these bentonites bind fumonosins quite well in the acidic ph let's say 3.5 but when it goes to the alkaline ph around 6 uh, you know this toxin is released back into the system so you know binding at alkaline ph is the most important one you know binding at acidic ph how does it matter you know still it get released get to the intestine small intestine again absorbed by the duodenum jejunum those kind of areas right so it's important that the product works at alkaline ph and then uh, that is the reason why we feel a mere mycotoxin binding strategy is not enough we we'll need to look at you know, whether it is birds pigs and dairy looking at uh, ingredients capable of improving immunity antioxidant status and, and gut health so that's where the, the mode of action for our product uh, comes into picture. Uh, you know, we consider the, of course, aflatoxins are carcinogenic. So we consider that impact. We have damaged the gut wall is taken care of. Oxidative stress uh, is an important aspect. So immunity is also an important factor. So by, by mycotoxin adsorption as our first mode of action, we reduce the bioavailability of the toxin. That means the toxin is not getting into the organs. By the second mode of action, third and the fourth mode of action, yes, you know, there is a bit of a bioavailability reduction for sure. If the gut health is good, but more of a uh, managing the risk what we already, the animals already have. Maybe they affect on different organs. We, we try to minimize that impact through the supplementation of these, uh, these different uh, functional uh, ingredients. So we'll not go through in detail, and that's why we have this portfolio of uh, Toxo MX, which is more of a aflatoxin managing product. And Toxo, if you have a gut health issues, in addition to the aflatoxin, Toxo XL, having more of an immune modulation added into that, and Toxo XXL, uh, looking at you know impact on antioxidants. Uh, I, yeah, it may sound look that a lot of products, but I think in cow dairy cows particularly, it's important that depending on dif different parts of the world, depending on the regulations, depending upon the kind of toxin we see, uh, we really need to uh, tailor made the approaches to fit into those uh, solutions. Because as I mentioned, the challenges are very complex. So just to go through very quickly on various binding uh, studies we have done, uh, aflatoxins, there are lots of studies we have done we consistently see more than 90% binding, binding for aflatoxins. We see also published a, a in vivo research uh, uh, early this year, uh, you know, where we fed very low levels of aflatoxin, even below the you know, European Union levels of uh, 2.2 ppb in the TMR. Uh, this was study done in a university in Italy. And then we added our, uh, our product uh, at 100 gram per head per day and we were able to reduce the aflatoxin M1 significantly by 65% reduction. So the already the toxin level was low, still we were able to do the job is because of high affinity of the product. And uh, you know, when you have high levels of toxins, the capacity becomes important. But when you have a low levels of toxins, especially for aflatoxins, in managing the human health, the product should work at a very low levels of my of the toxin also which was demonstrated here you can see there in the in the gray color uh, diagram uh, that's what our uh, treatment toxo mx was able to reduce about 65 percent so that the milk uh, uh, you know eu limit for aflatoxin m1 is, is met 
In the case of algae toxins, uh, a recent study uh, we did also, uh, you know, uh, this is available in literature as well. So the, uh, you know, the bentonites work quite well. We, on an average, we saw about 90% uh, uh, binding to different types of ergotoxins. toxins. We tested uh, uh, 12 different er uh, ergotoxins uh, at pH 6 uh, and 6.5 and 3, and both the levels we were able to see around uh, 90 uh, percent of binding to these ergot toxins. Other mycotoxins I mentioned already, uh, you know, Zia, Okra, and T2, somewhere between 35 to 50 percent binding. And Fumonacin, as I mentioned already, you see a very good binding at low pH, but no binding at the high pH. And this is something we need to take into account that whenever the in vitro data is given to the customers, they need to look at you know, what was the pH of uh, uh, the test wa was done. Dr. The emerging Sammy? mycotoxins, yes. We have about Hello. five more minutes. Yes, I will be done now, Mas. Thank you. Yes, it's perfect. So uh, coming to the, the emerging uh, mycotoxins, uh, Professor mentioned uh, uh, already about uh, Recofortin C, NEA chain, Sterigmatous cysteine. This is an area uh, we know that it's coming. Uh, in, in Europe becoming more aggressive. I'm sure it will come in the rest of the world as well. So we started looking, you know, how our product can help in these emerging mycotoxins. Again, we were able to see a significant binding around somewhere between 75 to 80, 83, 84 percent. So yes, I think there is some answer from our organization already towards the mycotoxins coming from the silages. And, uh, and some of these uh, coming can come from uh, grains as well. So LPS binding uh, around 90%. So again, uh, these silages can be a source of LPS. And in fact, the LPS can be produced within the body of the animals also. Uh, so you know that can be uh, bound to some extent by our toxin uh, binder. So the gut wall protection is, is very important. And uh, you know that was one of the ingredients, as I mentioned uh, in our product, which uh, uh, helps in reducing the inflammation because when you have a, uh, a poor tight junction integrity, the more mycotoxins, more pathogens pass through the uh, tight junctions causing inflammation. So that of course affects the gut health. And so animal health and performance will be compromised and we have identified a glucose biopolymer, a source uh, from the yeast, which is capable of increasing the tight junction protein uh, production. So two examples, uh, of course, we can share with you later uh, where we're using the Toxo or range of product, uh, uh, especially against Zeralanan. One study was done in Netherlands uh, where it is improving uh, compared to the uh, without using the product improvement both in the redu reduction in the number of inseminations per cow and also percentage of cows with the calf after the first in insemination was increased. And the study, uh, this is from uh, uh, Spain, I believe, and there we improve the fertility in terms of age detection, fertility, abortions coming down, pregnancy rate increasing. So certainly these are very important studies uh, doing in the field uh, because the complexity what we see in the field is sometimes very hard to replicate uh, under the research conditions. The third ingredient what we have is the immune modulator. Uh, the beta glucans are very well known immune modulators and uh, you know and the enzymatic suppression of this immune modulator has certainly helped us to keep this uh, immune modulator intact which increases the uh, the immunity, particularly to the macrophages. And Professor was mentioning quite a bit on macrophages in the, in the beginning, the innate immunity, and that can be managed uh, uh, with this uh, ingredient. The last component, uh, of course, is the impact on antioxidants. I think this is big uh, because the kind of mycotoxins we are having inside this TMR, a lot of them have impact uh, on production of free radicals. That's why you see a, a farm with a poor silage quality. You see more mastitis, laminitis, increased somatic cell counts. And I think uh, uh, ingredients capable of lowering uh, this uh, antioxidant production becomes very important. So that is why 
I think we are wor working a lot in this area, already included some of these uh, you know, active ingredients in our uh, product called Toxo XXL. So one story I want to share, uh, a success story, of course, from our colleagues, because I strongly believe the data coming out of the field is more important. This is come for coming from TN France, and they what they had they are really nicely using our system in place. What we have, uh, we have a master lab capable of analyzing or uh, using LCM SMS for uh, TMR analysis. As I mentioned before. LCM SMS analysis is important for TMR due to the high fiber content, high moisture content. They're using it, understand the challenge, what they have, and they go back to the customer, provide solutions according to the challenge. So one example, a farm uh, in, uh, in the western part of the France where they had a uh, rumen uh, uh, quality issues. As a result, what they thought was according to the analysis, a combined effect of HT2 toxin and Dawn synergy. And then they visited the farm or various conducted uh, investigations. Uh, you know, they went to the farm and, and in a, after a month, they already got an email from the farmer saying that they're seeing a significant uh, improvement in the milk production after adding the product Toxo XXL at 100 gram per head per day. And they found 2.5 kg increase in milk production, one point improvement in milk fat, Somatic cell count, I think in France, it is up to 250,000, but they were at 90,000, they were quite happy. And mastitis uh, stopped on the farm. And also, you know, the, the, the number of times at the robot was uh, 2.7, the number of times rejected by the robot was 2.8. That means the activity of the cows was also increasing and uh, a better reproduction as per the customer. So the customer was quite happy. He had a big challenge and the product was able to uh, help them out. So these, these success stories becomes critical uh, from the field. So to conclude, uh, uh, as a, a detailed uh, expert uh, opinion from Professor, as we know, she's, uh, she's the leader in the mycotoxins area uh, in ruminants. Uh, so there is a complexity of uh, uh, mycotoxins the dairy cows are exposed to. And uh, after toxin M1 management uh, is of public health importance. And that should be taken slightly different approach. You need more like a heads up approach for that. And then uh, other mycotoxins causing rumen health, intestinal health, immunity, antioxidant issues should be uh, considered by other toxins. And then a overall approach, uh, you know, 10 point system, what I mentioned, uh, taken into consideration. And then innovation in feed additives in terms of improving gut health, immunity, antioxidant status should also be considered in addition to the binding. And maybe a last word, probably we should call it as a mycotoxin mitigation agents rather than the binder, because we are very clearly seeing in, late, in recent times, the binding of mycotoxin is not good enough to solve many of the challenges. With that, uh, thank you so much, uh, Moss. I will be happy to answer questions.